chapter XIV, Dr. Dorian. The next day was Saturday. Fern stood at the kitchen sink drying the breakfast dishes as her mother washed them. Mrs. Arable worked silently. She hoped Fern would go out and play with other children instead of heading for the Zuckerman's barn to sit and watch animals. Charlotte is the best storyteller I ha ever heard, said Fern, poking her dish towel into a cereal bowl. Fern, said her mother sternly, you must not invent things. You know spiders don't tell stories. Spiders can't talk. Charlotte can, replied Fern. She doesn't talk very loud, but she talks. What kind of story did she tell, asked Mrs. Arable. Well, began Fern, she told us about a cousin of hers who caught a fish in her web. Don't you think that's fascinating? Fern, dear, how would a fish get in a spider's web, said Mrs. Arable. You know it couldn't happen. You're making this up. Oh, it happened all right, replied Fern. Charlotte never fibs. This cousin of hers built a web across a stream. One day she was hanging around on the web and a tiny fish leaped into the air and got tangled in the web. The fish was caught by one fin, mother. Its tail was wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. Can't you just see the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish? Charlotte's cousin kept slipping in, dodging out. She was beaten mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing fish, dancing in, dancing out, throwing. Fern, snapped her mother. Stop it. Stop inventing these wild tales. I'm not inventing, said Fern. I'm just telling you the facts. What finally happened, asked her mother, whose curiosity began to get the better of her. Charlotte's cousin won. She wrapped the fish up, then she ate him when she was got good and ready. Spiders have to eat, the same as the rest of us. Yes, I suppose they do, said Mrs. Arable vaguely. Charlotte has another cousin who is a balloonist. He's, she stands on her head, lets out a lot of line, and is carried aloft on the wind. Mother, wouldn't you simply love to do that? Yes, I would, come to think of it, replied Mrs. Arable. But Fern, darling... I wish you would play outside today instead of going to Uncle Homer's barn. Find some of your playmates and do something nice outdoors. You're spending too much time in that barn. It isn't good for you to be alone so much. Alone, said Fern. Alone? My best friends are in the barn cellar. It's a very sociable place. Not at all lonely. Fern disappeared after a while, walking down the road toward Zuckerman's. Her mother dusted the living sitting room. As she worked, she kept thinking about Fern. It didn't seem natural for a little girl to be so interested in animals. Finally, Mrs. Arable made up her mind she would pay a call on old Dr. Dorian and ask his advice. She got in the car and drove to his office in the village. Dr. Dorian had a thick beard. He was glad to see Mrs. Arable and gave her a comfortable chair. It's about Fern, she explained. Fern spends entirely too much time in the Zuckerman's barn. It doesn't seem normal. She sits on a milk stool in a corner of the barn cellar near the pig pen and watches animals hour after hour. She just sits and listens. Dr. Dorian leaned back and closed his eyes. How enchanting, he said. It must be real nice and quiet down there. Homer has some sheep, hasn't he? Yes, said Mrs. Arable. But it all started with that pig. We let Fern raise on a bottle. She calls him Wilbur. Homer bought the pig, and never, ever since it left our place, Fern has been going to her uncle's to be near it. I've been hearing things about that pig, said Dr. Dorian, opening his eyes. They say he's quite a pig. Have you heard about the words that appeared in the spider's web? Asked Mrs. Arable nervously. Yes, replied the doctor. Well, do you understand it? Asked Mrs. Arable understand what? Do you understand how there could be any writing in a spider's web? Oh no, said Dr. Dorian, I don't understand it. But for that matter, I don't understand how a spider learned to spin a web in the first place. When the words appeared, everyone said they were a miracle. But nobody pointed out that the web itself 
is a miracle. What's miraculous about a spider's web, asked Mrs. Arable. I don't see how you say a web is a miracle. It's just a web. Ever try to spin one, asked Dr. Dorian. <laughs> Mrs. Arable shifted uneasily in her chair. No, she replied, but I can crochet a doily and I can knit a sock. Sure, said the doctor, but someone taught you, didn't they? My mother taught me. Well, who taught a spider? A young spider knows how to spin a web without any instructions from anybody. Don't you regard that as a miracle? I suppose so, said Mrs. Arable. I never looked at it that way before. Still, I don't understand how those words got into the web. I don't understand it, and I don't like what I can't understand. None of us do, said Dr. Dorian, sighing. Hip, hip, hooray. I'm a doctor. Doctors are supposed to understand everything, but I don't understand everything, and I don't intend to let it worry me. Mrs. Arable fidgeted. Fern says the animals talk to each other, Dr. Dorian. Do you believe animals talk? I never heard one say anything, he replied, but that proves nothing. It is quite possible that an animal has spoken civilly to me, and I didn't catch the remark because I wasn't paying attention. Children pay better attention than grown-ups. If Fern says that the animals in Zuckerman's barn talk, I'm quite ready to believe her. Perhaps if people talked less, animals would talk more. People are incessant work talkers. I can give you my word on that. Incessant means they're always talking. Well, I feel better about Fern, said Mrs. Arable. You don't think I need to worry about her? Does she look well, asked the doctor. Oh, yes. Appetite good? Oh, yes, she's always hungry. Sleep well at night? Oh, yes. Then don't worry, said the doctor. Don't do you think she'll ever start thinking about something besides pigs and sheep and geese and spiders? How old is Fern? She's eight. Well, said Dr. Dorian, I think she will always love animals, but I doubt that she spends her entire life in the Homer Zuckerman's barn cellar. How about boys? Does she know any boys? She knows Henry Fussy, said Mrs. Arable brightly. Dr. Dorian closed his eyes again and went into deep thought. Henry Fussy, he mumbled. Hmm, remarkable. Well, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Let Fern associate with her friends in the barn if she wants to. I would say offhand that spiders and pigs are fully as interesting as Henry Fussy. Yet I predict that the day will come when even Henry will drop some chance remark that catches Fern's attention. It's amazing how children change from year to year. How's Avery, he asked, opening his eyes wide. Oh, Avery, chuckled Mrs. Arable. Avery is always fine. Of course, he gets into poison ivy and gets stung by wasps and bees and brings frogs and snakes home and breaks everything he lays his hands on. He's fine. Good, said the doctor. Mrs. Arable said goodbye and thanked Dr. Dorian very much for his advice. She felt greatly relieved. And we have time, that's the end of chapter 14. We have ch time to read chapter XV, which is called The Crickets. The crickets sang in the grasses. They sang the song of summer ending, a sad, monotonous song. Summer is over and gone, they sang, over and gone, over and gone. Summer is dying, dying. The crickets felt it was their duty to warn everybody that summertime cannot last forever. Even on the most beautiful days in the whole year, the days when summer is changing into fall, the crickets spread the rumor of sadness and change. Everybody heard the song of the crickets. Avery and Fern Arable heard it as they walked the dusty road. They knew that school would soon begin again. The young geese heard it and knew that they would never have be little goslings again. Charlotte heard it and knew that she hadn't much time left. Mrs. Zuckerman, in work, in, at work in the kitchen, heard the crickets, and a sadness came over her, too. Another summer gone, she sighed. Hip, hip, hooray. Lurvy, at work building a crate for Wilbur, heard the song and knew it was time to dig potatoes. Summer is over and gone, repeated the crickets. How many nights till frost, sang the crickets. Goodbye, Summer. Goodbye. Goodbye. 
The sheep heard the crickets and they felt so uneasy they broke a hole in the pasture fence and wandered up into the field across the road. The gander discovered the hole and led his family through and they walked to the orchard and ate the apples that were lying on the ground. A little maple tree in the swamp heard the cricket song and turned bright red with anxiety. That's actually a hip hip hooray for anxious. Wilbur was now the center of attraction at the, on the farm. Good food and regular hours had showed, were showing results. Wilbur was a pig any man would be proud of. One day, more than a hundred people came to stand at his yard and admire him. Hip hip hooray! Charlotte was, had written the word radiant, and Wilbur really looked radiant as he stood in the golden sunlight. Ever since the spider had befriended him, he had done his best to live up to his reputation. When Charlotte's Web said some pig, Wilbur had tried hard to look like some pig. When Charlotte's Web said terrific, Wilbur had tried to look terrific. And now that the Web said radiant, he did everything possible to make himself glow. This is an important lesson in Charlotte's Web. How we treat people is how they act. It is not easy to look radiant, but Wilbur threw himself into it with a will. He would turn his head slightly and blink his long eyelashes. Then he would breathe deeply, and when his audience grew bored, he would spring into the air and do a backflip with a half twist. At this, the crowd would yell and cheer. How's that for a pig, Mrs. Zuckerman would ask, well pleased with himself. That pig is radiant. Some of Wilbur's friends in the barn worried. Uh, for fear all this attention would go to his head and make him stuck up. But it never did. Wilbur was modest. Fame did not spoil him. He still worried some about the future, as he could hardly believe that a mere spider would be able to save his life. Sometimes at night he would have a bad dream. He would dream that men were coming to get him with knives and guns. But that was only a dream. In the daytime, Wilbur usually felt happy and confident. No pig ever had truer friends, and he realized that friendship is one of the most satisfying things in the world. Even the song of the crickets did not make Wilbur too sad. He knew it was almost time for the county fair, and he was looking forward to the trip. If he could distinguish, distinguish himself at the fair, and maybe win some prize money, he was sure Zuckerman would let him live. Charlotte had worries of her own, but she kept quiet about them. One morning, Wilbur asked her about the fair. You're going with me, aren't you, Charlotte? He said. Well, I don't know, replied Charlotte. The fair comes at a bad time for me. I shall find it inconvenient to leave home, even for a few days. Why? asked Wilbur. Oh, I just don't feel like leaving my web too much going on around here. Please come with me, begged Wilbur. I need you, Charlotte. I can't stand going to the fair without you. You've just got to come. No, said Charlotte. I believe I'd better stay home and see if I can't get some work done. What kind of work, asked Wilbur. Egg laying. It's time I made an egg sack and filled it with eggs. I didn't know you could lay eggs, said Wilbur in amazement. Oh, sure, said the spider. I'm versatile. What does versatile mean? Full of eggs? asked Wilbur. <laughs> Certainly not, said Charlotte. Versatile means I can turn with ease from one thing to another. It means I don't have to limit my activities to spinning and trapping and stunts like that. Why don't you come with me to the fairgrounds and lay your eggs there, pleaded Wilbur. It would be wonderful fun. Charlotte gave her web a twitch and moodily watched it sway. I'm afraid not, she said. You don't know the first thing about egg laying, Wilbur. I can't arrange my family duties to suit the management of the county fair. When I get ready to lay eggs, I have to lay eggs, fair or no fair. However, I don't want you to worry about it. You might lose weight. We'll leave it this way. I'll come to the fair if I possibly can. Oh, good, said Wilbur. I knew you wouldn't forsake me just when I need you most. All that day, Wilbur stayed inside, taking life easy in the straw. Charlotte rested and ate a grasshopper. She knew that she couldn't help Wilbur much longer. 
In a few days, she would have to drop everything and build a beautiful little sack that would hold her eggs. And that is the end of chapter 15. Tomorrow we'll read chapter XVI, Off to the Fair.